Well, uh, very good Sunday morning <coughs> to each one of you. And uh, we praise God for all that He continues to do. As we continue to pray and wait upon the Lord, let's continue strong in the grace of God. <coughs> and uh, I am uh, sort of... Uh, uh, looking at which dimension you as I uh, try to look at the computer screen. Uh, the angel over USA has been, uh, has been uh, a constant uh, flash that keeps coming up. And I believe the Lord wants me to say something about that. Uh, throughout the last uh, week or so, I talked about how he has raised his sword up. And uh, because in the back of my mind and heart, sometimes I get something that is there as to what to happen. I know how U.S. is going to divide it into uh, left and right. Uh, and then after that, there were uh, uh, like a cross stroke between it this way and this way. And then it divides into four, sesh, four sections, uh, remembering the prophecies of the Lord. And so because of that, uh, my heart and mind wants to see that stroke that is there. <clears throat> but the uh, uh, Lord has been speaking to me, say, uh, that is another different thing to what the angel of uh, USA wants to do. And this time I checked a map carefully because he was like raising his sword and he was like putting the edge of his sword down. <clears throat> I keep looking at the edge of the sword cross and uh, you must remember that visions that we see in the Lord can only be clear if our heart <clears throat> is not thinking anything. Like I always used to train you all that when we are seeing, we don't interpret, we don't do anything, we just let it flow. <clears throat> but because of the prophetic word of the Lord that was still there, there's always a background that I meditated for some time. <clears throat> and uh, the other was a uh, uh, resistant to seeing him. I was looking to him, I had seen him put the cross this way. But there's resistance to see him put his sword anywhere else. And uh, so finally, when I'm able to quiet uh, what I would, um, uh, what I call uh, prejudicially want to see, thing uh, remove and the heart is just clean and quiet, I saw that he was actually uh, putting the edge of his sword to the right side. When you see a map, it's on the right side. Then I keep looking to see where the edge is touching. Then uh, it looks like it just the tip of it was touching right to the extreme side. And I checked at the map. It's actually where New York was. And so something is about to burst out to begin from there and um, and I know that sword's going to move so I will update you more <clears throat> when I see more and it seems to be like uh, we know uh, we are also measuring things in the natural at the same time how the spiritual converts into the natural but I believe that it relates to recent cases that are happening and, and this is important in the sense that it's using this expression, the straw that broke the camel's back. The beginning of something that we have not seen before. Uh, bear in mind the visions and the prophecies that we have of the, um, the riots that are coming forth. Yes, riots are going to take place in USA. Uh, disharmony in a racial area. Disharmony between rich and poor. Uh, and then disharmony caused by weather conditions of drought and lack of water. 
And these things will exist for a couple of years, at least three if not more, before the year 2027. And so I work backwards on that time. Three years before 2027 will bring us to 2024. And uh, because of what happened within U.S. for a period at least three to four years, uh, U.S. make a decision uh, in 2027 to go into Spain. So with all this background and watching what's happening, I believe that we all should watch and pray as we see events unfold especially praying for our brethren in USA, uh, that each one of them would take note to be at the right place at the right time by the year 2027, where the war years begin. So let's watch and pray in this area and note that which is to come. And uh, be prayerful all the time for the perfect will of God to be done and for His kingdom to be established. That is the Lord's prayer. His will be done, His kingdom be established. And those things are still the heart and the mind, the center of what God is doing as He permits different things to take place uh, on, on the earth. Well, with that <clears throat> being set aside, <clears throat> uh, let's look at uh, the seven spirits and um, the new dimension and the, and what the seven spirit is doing uh, in our heart and in our life. It is interesting that uh, the picture of the outer court and the holy place and the most holy place comes again to us uh, as I mentioned from last Friday's teaching. Uh, whatever needs to happen in the outer court has already taken place. Jesus has become our Passover lamb. And uh, Jesus has, is the word make flesh and he has already come upon the earth. And only what is in the holy place now needs to come upon the earth and fulfill itself. And there's a threefold thing, the work of the Holy Spirit, which is the candlestick, and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, which is the table of showbread, and the altar incense, which is the establishment of praise and worship on the earth by God's people. <clears throat> These three events will be related to each other, just as Jesus as a Passover lamb and Jesus as a the word make flesh are simultaneous events that took place. And uh, although, in a sense, the word make flesh came, and 33 years later, he became the Passover lamb. But even from the beginning of his ministry, he was called the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. <coughs> As announced by John the Baptist. So we have three major events that are taking place in the holy place and they will be completed. And the Holy Spirit has already come down for nearly 2,000 years since the day of Pentecost. And the candlestick has already started and it has lightened up, became stronger and uh, through the Pentecostal revival and uh, continue in a Pentecostal move. And there was simultaneously a word of faith movement that came about. God has used prophets, uh, prophet teachers like Kenneth Hagin to bring about the word of faith movement. And of course, we do acknowledge that each movement has its extreme uh, phenomena which are not in line with the word of God. Nevertheless, we acknowledge that these are moves of God initiated by God and His angels and they have resulted <clears throat> and brought forth an emphasis and a balance in the church to go about in a direction that God wants it to be so. 
And part of the completed work of the candlestick is the work of the seven spirits, which again I emphasize is something that is revealed only towards the end of the uh, time of the first century church. By the time John was in Patmos Island, a lot of the other apostles have gone home to be with the Lord. And the visions that he recorded at Patmos reveal more things that has not been seen before. The four living creatures are seen in greater detail and uh, seven seals followed by the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And then there was a revelation of the 24 elders, which uh, again has not been seen before in any other book of the Bible. All the other 65 books in the Bible do not show the 24 elders at all. And the closest that you can have is the vision of Daniel, who saw thrones uh, around the time of uh, 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 when Daniel was uh, looking into that dimension. So just for a little glimpse, uh, let's look at Daniel, understanding that he saw something, but he was not able to count the number of thrones around and uh, But he did mention this in Daniel chapter 7, in verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. And then there's a description of the Ancient of Days, which is exactly like the description of Jesus in John chapter 1 by uh, the Apostle John. The uh, description is his garment was white as snow, the hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was like a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued uh, and came forth from and before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. So there was the, some sort of description of thrones that were established there together with the Ancient of Days. And it's thrones, plural. And at that time in the book of Daniel, of course, he peered into heaven where time does not exist. And he could literally be seeing the same things that John the Apostle see. And... Uh, except with uh, different clarity, which John saw in greater detail. And this is interesting because, um, once again, uh, just before I got up this morning, I had some sort of a link, I don't know how to say it, some sort of a link or consciousness uh, about the 24 elders again. I believe that their work is important in these end times. Uh, the 24 elders, and I got up with uh, the number 24 vibrating through my consciousness. So that was interesting to see and to know uh, these things that are taking place and the dominion that is going to come to our Lord God. Let's look at the book of Revelations, chapter 3. And today I want to talk about the work of the seven spirit, the spirit of mercy. We have shown how the spirit of Ephesus or of peace established the presence of God. The spirit of uh, Smyrna or the spirit of love and truth peace and righteousness and love and truth, establish the indwelling of Christ in us. Each one has their own specific work. And uh, please meditate through that. It means that if you have more peace, you will have more the presence of God in your life. If you have more love in your life, you have more of Christ in you flowing through you. Uh, the opposite is true. If you have less love, then Christ cannot dwell inside you in a greater measure. And then, of course, you have the spirit of uh, glory and of joy. And that 
establishes uh, in each one of us uh, uh, what I call uh, in each one of the, that joy, which is the second dimension of God. And uh, from the presence of God in our life, in number one, to the indwelling of Christ, to number three, the presence of heaven. That sense of heaven will always keep causing you to turn upwards towards heaven. That's something that is exalted upon us in Colossians 3 verse 1, where it says to set your mind on things above and that comes as a result of the work of the spirit of glory and of joy uh, the presence of heaven the absence of the world even though we live in a world we are not of the world and constantly you are pulled towards a consciousness of heaven to look at this life more of from the heavenly perspective than to look at this life from the earthly perspective. It's a two different way of thinking, two different way of living. Because your priorities and your decision making is different. When you make a decision while looking at the results and consequences in heaven, rather than looking at the results and consequences over a few months or a few years uh, on the earthly life. Then you have the spirit of life and of holiness, which begins to do things in us that are of the nature of the spiritual dimension. And it brings upon us uh, the face of Christ, which is a position of power and of great favor in the Lord. And then you have... Uh, uh, this, uh, the next one, uh, there's a spirit of power. Oh, that's uh, the fifth would be the spirit of um, uh, life and of holiness. I forgot in between. Uh, number four was the spirit of power and of faith that bring about uh, the face of Christ uh, in our life. Uh, place, position of power, position of favor. You have the spirit of life and of holiness which turns us into a life-giving spirit and we flow and become uh, uh, what I call personified together with the river of life and the tree of life. And last week I speak about the spirit of wisdom and revelation that um, uh, brings us to the place in God, uh, uh, to the mind of Christ, where we partake of a, a sense of His omnipresence, a sense of His omnipotence, a sense of His omniscience. And it's like uh, uh, being a pillar in the, in the throne of God, a sense of uh, stillness, yet it gives you the power of projected uh, consciousness and projected uh, uh, dimension. Uh, there's nothing on earth that can compare or describe that. Last week, I tried to use different illustrations to show forth that you could be in one place in God where God says you shall go out no more. And in that place in God, yet a part of you can be projected in a real consciousness form of interaction where you could where uh, having a physical body or a consciousness of a body is just a tool to you then brings us to the final part of the spirit of mercy and of grace 
The end result of the spirit of mercy and grace is the throne. The throne of God. And today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the throne of God. But let me read from Revelation chapter 3 at the blessing of the church of Laodicea to the overcomers. It says here in verse 21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You can see in verse 21, it's already there. All these seven things that happened to us has already happened or been initiated. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is the work of the seven spirits. It has already been initiated. For Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are seated with Christ. And it says, together with. We are seated together with Christ. The work of the seven spirits has already been initiated. But what we are speaking in the end times is, it is completed. We are positionally seated with Christ. But it won't be just positionally. It would be in reality, uh, in completed reality of the spiritual dimension, of the natural dimension. So both will be completed. Uh, the Bible does understand this time realm uh, thing. Because when the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 and in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 and chapter 1 speaks about all things are placed under his feet, it quickly acknowledged that all things are not yet placed under the feet. So there is a sense of it is already done, <clears throat> but in the time realm, it is not completed yet. But both these realms will be synchronized as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 when all things are put under the feet of Jesus in a completed physical dimension. Christ will hand it over to the Father and then the Father will be all in all. This blessing that Christ gave us in the Laodicean Church of the Overcomers, is speaking about a completed realm. It's just like mankind was not able to eat of the tree of life from the time of Adam's fall all the way to Jesus until Jesus completed his work and the first blessing of the Overcomers in, to the Ephesus Church was you eat of the tree of life. Finally, we partake of the tree of life, which we have begun to eat in Christ because Christ is in a sense the tree of life. So we have the completion of these seven realities in our life. The completed work of the spirit of uh, seven spirit, the spirit of mercy and of revelation is we are at the throne room. We are seated with Christ experientially, spiritually, and naturally in our whatever form of spiritual body that God gave us in eternity. What is it like to be seated at the throne room of God? Way back in the 90s, uh, we had a uh, tabernacle glory and we published a uh, regular uh, news magazine. When I was doing a Saba convention meeting, I experienced Jesus taking me 
and allowing me to sit uh, where he sat, it became quite controversial for many people because they say, well, how can you see the throne of God? But it is in the Ephesians 2 context. And it was to experience what it was like. And the experience was, what is it to be seated with Christ Jesus? You ask people, what is it to be seated uh, with Christ Jesus as in Ephesians 2? So we're not talking about any controversial thing. We're not talking about God vacating His throne. Of course not. But we're take, talking about the redemption of Christ and what Christ gave us. And I was privileged that I could experientially experience that. It was like all the energies of the universe was going through you. And it was like, um, like if you were to change your thought or shift your thought wavelength, it would immediately have an impact in the whole universe. Because the throne of God is what is sustaining the entire universe. Yes, the spiritual and the physical realm. So it was a very, very awesome experience. Uh, on top of that, it was like in that position of Christ's power seated at the right hand of God, any movement you make, if you could like lift up your little finger, would have rocked all of the universe. But this balance equilibrium of power was mitigated with all the galactic beings that are in existence, they are holding, they are like the 24 elders and the galactic beings are the, uh, uh, and forgive me Lord for using illustrations on this earth, they are so limited. Uh, it is like, pardon me, 24 elders for illustrating like that. It is like uh, when you travel in a car or any vehicle that moves, uh, like for example, men used to ride on horses. Do you know that when you ride a horse, it's not like you travel this way smoothly? When you ride on a horse, you have to get used to the gallop, which is the horse go So the rider of the horse gets used to the gallop and it's not necessarily very friendly to your, to your seat and to your backbone, which is why later on saddles were invented and the saddle sort of absorbed some of the gallop to make your ride a little bit more smooth so you don't fall all over the place, you're just on the raw back of a horse. And then they invented uh, wagons or chariots and so the horse would still be galloping but the chariot, the wagon or whatever you're sitting on with the wheels being dragged by the horse would, would, would move but of course it's not 100% smooth movement. Finally, electric cars were invented or diesel cars, so I run ahead of myself because thinking today electric car, but the uh, fossil fuel cars that use diesel kerosene were invented and so you will write, uh, generally you will write in this manner, except that the roads were not smooth. So every time you go over a road bump, you go pick, pick, pick. So there were still some bumps. Finally, they invented uh, springs and today we call them springs or shock, shock absorbers. They're inside uh, all the wheels 
and they try to make your car ride. Today, your car ride is smooth in this way. That's because we also have good roads. But if the road were to go up and down, of course, you would still feel yourself going up and down. Nevertheless, with the building of engineering of roads and of uh, short absorbers and of springs inside our car, most of the time, your car ride from your place to the supermarket or another place that you want to go or your workplace is a smooth ride. You are not bumping all the way. Not bumping up and down, bumping up and down, you know, you're not bumping up and down. It's a smooth ride. And we modern creatures are so used to a smooth ride that we don't realize how bumpy it was long, long ago to travel in, in a horse, in a chariot, in a wagon, or in old cars without shock, shock absorbers. Well, the 24 elders and uh, galactic beings, if I can use this word, now remember, this is 0.001% of the true universal picture. So uh, God, uh, forgive me for uh, downgrading the illustration because I cannot find any other illustration. Uh, they are like the shock, shock absorbers of the amount of energy that is released on the throne room. Of course, the energy that flows from the throne room is first mitigated by praise and worship. The four living creatures and 24 elders to a certain extent also part of the worship. And in New Jerusalem, the 144,000 worshippers. And so, there is a mitigation of the energy flow, so it's more steady, more regular and more easy on creation. Otherwise, creation will be destroyed by the energy. <clears throat> uh, something like what they are trying to do, which I actually had the idea, and I'm glad that some pe other people had the idea. You know how nuclear uh, power is like? There are two types of nuclear power. And we have... Um, uh, nuclear power that comes through fission or nuclear decay. You can use uranium-238, plutonium-239 or, or radioactive thorium, which is a more safe type of uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear power that can be harnessed. And they are today building a few more uh, radioactive thorium um, power plants, which I uh, look forward to see what it's like because uh, it will be interesting. They can build it smaller and it won't be as dangerous as 238 uh, two, uranium or plutonium 239. Uh, um, <clears throat> so that's usually using nuclear fission where the radioactive material is giving out uh, radioactivity which is very poisonous to us and has to be uh, shielded. But the radioactivity, when it's harnessed, produces heat. That heat is used to heat up water, and when water heats up, it circulates, and then as the steam moves and circulates, it turns um, the turbines, which are using magnets, and thus the magnets, as they move, create electricity. That has been the standard nuclear power. But as you read in the news, they are trying to do fusion reactors. Fusion use uh, heavy hydrogen to fuse together and that's the power of the sun. And of course the sun fuse not just hydrogen, but they fuse bigger and bigger elements as the star go to different stage until it fuses its iron core and then it goes into supernova as the last phase. But um, if you have a huge fusion reaction going on and it needs a lot of energy, and uh, today's nuclear bombs are like fission fusion bomb. 
and they can make it fu fusion, 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 fusion bomb, multiple it to make a bomb more explosive. Uh, today's fusion bomb is heated up by the nuclear explosion of fission. And so it fused together and create a second rea nuclear reaction and thus you have the hydrogen bomb. So what they do in nuclear fusion is instead of having a lot of material, they reduce the material to a small tiny bit and what they're trying to do is have nuclear fusion in a mini scale so that it's easier to control. And that's why they need magnets because there are no elements strong enough to stand that fusion reaction. Whereas the magnets can hold the molecules that are produced in its plasma state in, in, uh, uh, within a containment chamber. And so they have little pellets, tiny little pellets of heavy hydrogen, which they use uh, laser to heat up. Pish, pish, pish. So you can imagine, if they could have it on a constant stream, and it's regulated, and the little pellets are passing through, so you will have little nuclear fusion. Pish, and, then pish. and each time it produces sufficient heat, that can then be harnessed into electricity uh, through, through turning turbines or, or what, however they use it, then we will be having the first successful nuclear fusion. So today when you read the news and you say, oh, they've achieved how many seconds or, or what level of energy, uh, then you know what is it about. That... Um, uh, the energy they put in, they must get more energy out. And so, if they can hold the reaction longer and stronger, then they can start sending pellets in. In case you didn't realize it, uh, until Mazda started the rotary engine, most engines are piston engine. That means uh, there is a shaft and a chamber where there's a spark plug and, and the plug and as they compress the petrol or the diesel, it is compressed and then the spark, uh, there's a spark, the spark produces an explosion and then the piston goes down again and then it goes up again and then sometimes you've got four piston engine or three piston engine so you, you get the constant sparking that is going on in a car. Uh, and that's how a car engine works. Uh, and so, uh, uh, that's where uh, I call it control energy. So the 24 elders and the four living creatures and the 144,000 in New Jerusalem and the uh, galactic beings, for lack of a better word, are like the containment chambers and mitigating uh, balancing of energies that are released that will give the whole universe a smooth ride. Otherwise, the earth will be bumpy and, um, and hu human civilizations will be hard to exist. Uh, and so, they are the mitigating and the containment harmonizing of the energies that are released from God. Nevertheless, the throne room is where the energy of the universe is released. And to explain it to some of you who might have visions that saw how angels can energize things, the angel's energy or the spirit being's energy is a secondary or a fourth or fifth down the scale energy that has been absorbed from God. The origin of all thought, all existence, all consciousness, all energies come from the throne room. The throne room is the engine of the whole universe. 
and all the spirit beings, angels receive their energy directly or indirectly. But indirectly, what I mean is sometimes transfer from angel to angel, spirit being to spirit being, going down the scale to mitigate the energy that is going on in the universe, both creatively and also in uh, maintenance and working mode. The source of all the energy is the universe. Now, for this sermon, God not only reminded me of the time when Jesus allowed me to experience Ephesians 2 seated on his throne and what it was like, God showed me the dimensional change that has taken place in the throne room itself so that I could understand what's happening to us too as the seven spirit of mercy and grace transform us. It's a throne room uh, transformation. And so from the presence of God to the throne room itself, God showed me throughout this week as I meditated on uh, the work of the seventh spirit of mercy and grace, the dimensional shift that has taken place in the throne room. See, if you go to the throne room now, in the spiritual realm, in this present universe, and that has been existing since since the time of the angels, since the age of the angels, even prior to the angelic rebellion, you would have seen the throne room as a source of all light and energy. And there's a like a shape of some sort of a humanoid figure sitting in a sitting position. And there need not be an actual chair that is there. It's just a humanoid figure in a seated position, so bright and shining that you can only see the outline. And that's what the throne room is like in its present state, with one exception that Jesus, when he rose on the dead, changed it a little bit. And I'll explain that. And as he existed from the time of the angels until the creation of man in Adam and Eve time, as he existed, you could see the throne, you could approach the throne based on the protocol that is required. And angels used to refer to it as the most high God because to them that's the highest spiritual point that they could see. I experience. And the thing about the throne is you couldn't go behind the throne room. There was no way you could go to the throne room from the back. In this present universe, there is no back of the throne room. <laughs> you, you just approach the throne room from the front. And yes, the, they are the surrounding things around the throne room and all that. But you could not approach the throne room from the side, from the left, from the right, or from the top, or from behind. Every time you go to the throne room, you find that you're approaching it from the front. So that is what it's like in the universe from the time when the Word came into this created universe, from the time when there was a beginning. And even in the beginning, before uh, all creation, you could only see the Word, but you couldn't go behind the Word. And then with creation, that place of the Word begins to look like the throne room the source of all energy in the universe. You could never go from the bottom, the top, the left, the right, or behind. Whichever way, when you go to a throne room, you're always approaching it from the front. So that was interesting phenomena. 
when Jesus rose from the dead and the Father revealed an extra level, the throne room received another level of energy. For lack of a better word, I call it the Christ energy. And the entire throne room was changed and transformed together with all the universe. And you read about that in Philippians 2 when the Father God says, Let all that are in heaven and on earth and under the earth worship Jesus whose name became the name by which all living beings now bow to. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. So when Jesus completed his work on earth, you should have seen what it was like in, in heaven. The whole heaven was transformed with a different light. The interesting thing about this light is even though the throne room received a mega scale of light. It's like seven times more glorious than it was before. And you could imagine at that seven times more glorious, the universe which should have been blown up. Yet it was not because Christ contained it. And with that extra measure of force and energy that is released upon the universe when Christ ascended and the Lamb of God opened the keys, uh, opened a level and a channel that was not there before, it was like during the time of the age of the angels, all you could see was the outer court. Then in the age of mankind, when God created man, it was like the holy place. And then when Jesus ascended on high, the Lamb of God, it was like the holy of holies. So it was like the... Even a throne room has gone through dimensional change. From the Old Testament, uh, from, from the age of the angels, to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, and when new heaven, new earth comes. And for God, it was like a changing of a scroll. You see something described in the Bible, like uh, the book of Revelations around chapter, should be around chapter 20, where at the end of all things, it says in chapter, oh, chapter 20, chapter 21, verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. It was like, it just disappeared, like a scroll disappeared, like turning a page. So it was like the age of the angels, then the creation of man, then a page change, and then the New Testament, uh, Christ going up, another page change. And uh, this glory, even though it was like seven times more glorious, Yet there was a greater clarity. It's like suddenly the image of the throne began to take on the image of Christ. And you might not realize what a privilege it was for mankind. It was like, um, it was like uh, the image of uh, mankind being like Jesus, you know, there was no way what he looked like. But when he was born in human flesh, Jesus took on a certain image. Now that image in his glorified form was 
added to the throne room and the image shone like seven times brighter but at the same time you know when something becomes seven times as bright as it was it becomes even harder to see but instead of being harder to see it became clearer that's something I don't know how to describe or cannot find illustration on earth it's brighter but yet clearer and I could see that whatever energy that was released by Christ could not be released fully in this present universe it needs new heaven new earth to be released in its formation and then come new heaven new earth you might not appreciate new heaven new earth but there is a using what the word um, there was a uh, paradigm shift when it changed to new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Because where before I say that in the throne room, you could not go behind it, on top of it, beneath it, or level right. You could only approach it from the front. In New Jerusalem, the throne room was in the center of New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem is a cube. With God's throne in the center, and you still have the basic four living creatures, 24 elders, but at the same time you got 144,000 that became the worshippers that contain that cube-like manifestation of the throne room. Now being inside New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem has four sides, including top and bottom. And everything is described as in Revelation 21. So for the first time, you could see New Jerusalem like a cube. And it is the cube that now energizes all of heaven and all of earth. It's still the source of all thought, existence, consciousness, and energy that power new heaven, new earth. With the exception that now is not just the throne of God. It's the throne of God contained in New Jerusalem, which shines and powers the whole universe. And this looks like the original plan of God, that God had in mind. And we are all going to be part of the New Jerusalem. And for the first time, the throne has a dimension. Where before you approach on the front, now there's a dimension in which there is north, south, east, west, plus up and down. Six dimensions to the throne room. So something changed. I call that a dimensional shift. Of the throne room to be contained maybe the word contained is not good enough express personified to new jerusalem so i had to describe all this and then turn around to describe how we all became a part of new jerusalem and the bride of christ and became one of the, and forgive me again for using very limited human language, one of the fireflies 
that light the entire universe. With us being part of New Jerusalem and part of the throne room, where all energy supplies the energy of the new heaven, new earth. So what happened in the work of the seven spirit of mercy and grace is we become part of the energy reactors that power the universe. That was a hard way to describe it. And we become literally part of the throne room. What a long, long way it has taken us from the evangelical doctrine that we are saved from sin, we have a ticket to heaven, we are saved for heaven, we have a heavenly existence, to we have an eternal existence, to we are part of the throne room existence. So you can imagine, finally we see why we exist. And let me try to describe it. It was like when God revealed himself in the universe, at the throne room, he wanted to power, create, and bring more things into the universe. But he could not. Because if he did in its raw first revelation, any additional energy release would have destroyed the universe. And so God has been creating this organic energy. The cube, New Jerusalem, which powers the universe unceasingly and without limit. God can, through eons of time, reveal himself without limit. I tell you, we're in for a fantastic ride. When God can now reveal himself without limit, but still for us progressively, through the rest of eternity, because he now has an organic energy of the throne room that he has forged from the best of the best of the universe, which includes angels and spirit beings and of the human race in Christ and through Christ to be part of this organic engine for new heaven, for new heaven. And this organic, for lack of a better word, please forgive me for my metaphors, this organic spiritual throne room engine of which you are all part of, becomes the source of all energy, and you are only thinking of energy, but I'm thinking of many more things. Revelations of God, consciousness of existence, wisdom and, and uh, conception and creative forces that could not be released before, and many, many more things. So don't think about it as just energy engine. It is also revelation engine. It is also existence engine. There are many, many levels of existence that can be now released. It is also a theological engine that releases more understanding and relationship with God. It is also a consciousness engine where the consciousness of all things can be enhanced even greater. 
And there are many more things to it that I don't have human words to describe. But that's what it's like. Having described this awesomeness of the dimensional shift of the throne room, number one, we are part of the throne room. Part of this throne room organic engine. That will exist in the next new eternity of the new heavens and the new earth. That's powerful. It will radiate, and the new heaven is very, very much larger than the present heaven. And God can reveal Himself even more than you ever reveal. We are part of that. That's number one. Of the throne room organic energy. And number two, we will experience, though we are created beings, a sense of the being of God-likeness that God wants us to experience, that we could not experience until this work of the seven spirits has been completed in us. We are perfectly one with God and our consciousness and existence is from the very place where God bring his existence into, in this created universe. So that's two. And that's a really powerful, I'm trying to think of more points, but what more points can you say when you taste of being one with Father God and being an heir and joint heir with Christ, which is a sense of God-likeness. But yet in our humble abode, humility, and our existence and knowledge that we were created beings. So number one, we are part of this tro- organic throne, throne room energy. Number two, we have this sense of God, God, Godhood and Godhead. I don't have vocabulary for that. That's one of the powerful works of the Spirit of Grace and Mercy. And and number three, the side effect on us is, you remember how the Bible says God is love, God is light, and in Him there is no shadow of turning. So we're not talking about absence of sin, absence of the world, or absence of whatever. We're talking about the presence of a light in us such that there can exist no not even a shadow or turn of darkness. Let me describe point three even more. I mean none of us can conceive what it is like to become pure love and pure light without even a sense of negativity, a sense of uh, anger, a sense of imperfections, a sense of uh, hate, a sense of 
all the things that we as humans have been feeling on the negative sides in our progress. It's like a pure existence as love, light, and life. Okay, I think that's the best words I can do for number three. A sense of pure existence as love, light, and life without shadow of turning. So I repeat the three points again, the work of the Spirit of Grace and Revelation. Number one, we are part of the organic engine of the new dimensional throne room from New Jerusalem. Number two, we have a sense of the Godhead or Godhood for lack of a better word, of the sense of being of God. Number three, there is this sense of being pure light, pure love, and pure life without anything else within us or within our existence or within our consciousness. Well, that's as good as I can describe it. And that concludes the work of the seven spirits in us. Of course, there's much more thing God can reveal, but I think even this introduction is enough to boggle everything in our mind and life and turn it upside down. Father, we pray that this revelation of God, this revelation of the Godhead, will be expressed and we partake of a sense of it, of these powers of the age to come, even while on earth now. Thank you, Father, for giving an understanding of this and to open the hearts and minds of each of these to understand that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise God. And uh, I will open myself to questions and answers. But let me just on the power cable. So if you have uh, questions, uh, you can now post in the chat. Okay, Pastor, you can unmute yourself. I, I mute you because of the sound of the toilet. There we go. <laughs> mm.
Hmm. I don't see any questions yet. I thought you guys would be talking to one another. Well, to me, this sermon today is mind blowing. Uh, already last week and the week before, each time it take one scale, one scale, one scale. But uh, it's uh, been stretching the mind and imagination to try to describe uh, the effects of seven spirits. Uh, Colin, you can make your comments while waiting for all day. Uh, so, Pastor, just now you said that, you know, the best description is like, we, we are to become the uh, the light, life, and uh, light of God. Uh, mm. Which is which is actually the, the attributes of God, right? The light, yes. life, his light, his life. And, yes, the three things, yeah. And so, indeed, uh, uh, Christ is the firstborn and we are to be like him, to indeed be... Code, code, you know, actually, Christians is little Christ, right? To be <laughs> the, the, the quite, quite a nice word, yes. Uh, uh, to be Christ to the world, right? Yes, mm. and that's why I encourage every one of you mm. if you ever continue to harbor hatred in your life, unforgiveness in your life, bitterness in your life, or um, selfishness in your life, or all these traits that belong to humans, it will prevent you from being godlike. You know, in the movies, all the godlike powers or heroes or superheroes, many of them express characters like the mythological gods of the Greeks who are immoral, who are uh, uh, human with superpowers, all these cannot exist. They only exist in the worst case scenario in demons and fallen angels. To exist as a godlike being for eternity without darkness, with light life and uh, uh, light life and love is to exist with that pure holiness and pure moral uprightness and pure knowing of what is good and never evil. Mm. Any extra power that is given, that is demonstrated in a uh, evil way only make a person like a fallen angel that deserve the lake of fire to truly be godlike and have godlike powers one must be and have the attributes of God pure love for everyone Pure light giving to everything. You cannot even hate your enemy. That's why Jesus came and put a higher standard. So, Pastor, uh, just now as you were teaching, uh, I was lo looking at this um, uh, this uh, Psalm uh, 118. I will put up the on the screen. Oh yes, please. Do. We can look at it together. Mm. Um, so we see here that uh, Psalm 118 actually talks about the stone in which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We are the building. So indeed, indeed, we are actually the building of this new Jerusalem. So Jesus being the chief cornerstone, we are like him. And to bring forth, you know, the, the, the blessing uh, of, the, of the Lord to the whole universe. So um, when I was looking at this, um, this I, I actually searched out this verse that, uh, that came to my mind as you were teaching about 
uh, binding the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. So it says in verse 27, God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. So I, I guess the uh, this sacrifice is referring to uh, Jesus because um, uh, it, it was mentioned about Jesus uh, earlier on and it also mm-hmm. talked about the day the Lord has made me glad and um, blessed is he, is he who come in the name of the Lord. So uh, if we look at the Old Testament, uh, it talks about these horns on the altar, uh, the horns, I mean, the altar, of course, is the altar of mercy, you know, the, the mercy of the Lord. Um, they don't do this, right? I mean, uh, they don't bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. So, no, never. So David is actually bring forth this prophecy. This some there's something special about about this, right? Uh, I mean, of course, we can know that. I mean, from the New Testament, Jesus, you know, because of Jesus, He has brought us uh, together with Him, you know, to the mercy seat, to this uh, uh, holy holiest of holies, uh, uh, to be with the presence of the Lord, but. Uh, is there more to it that, Pastor, we, you, you can see and it show to us? Uh, I believe the way the Bible recorded it is like um, uh, Paul had the same revelation in David and pushed it further. Instead of a dead sacrifice, he says a living sacrifice in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. So this vision of us being a sacrifice to God, but not dead, but living, that applies because you don't need to bind a dead animal and they actually never bind the sacrifice uh, uh, to the altar. And, uh, uh, but when a sacrifice is life, then you bind. And so this points all the way back to Abraham when he bound Isaac to the altar. And of course, the offer of Isaac to God is a metaphor of Jesus offering himself as our sacrifice. So that joins together to us in Christ being a living sacrifice and it's like a projection of us being his body. And that is why uh, the phrase says, uh, you are my God and I'll praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. And uh, it is uh, now some sort of oneness that we have in Christ and in God. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is also like how Paul says he's like a bond servant, uh, you know, bounded to the the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, and it's funny because, you know, I always wait on the Lord for what's the next message. And uh, just now when I took a break, uh, and as I walked back, the Lord dropped uh, next week's sermon uh, series. And it's to teach on how all things work for good to those who love Him. So that's interesting. I really got next week's series. Uh, but today, uh, the title is uh, uh, Third Dimension of Seven Spirits, and the subtitle is The Spirit of Mercy and of Grace. I have some questions coming. It says, uh, Wow, Pastor, thank you. There was some new, fresh spiritual manner. My question is if one was to reach, for example, only the sixth dimension, today is the seventh dimension in this human life, does this entail not being part of the new dimension throne room or New Jerusalem? Ha! Huh. Good question there. Now, even within New Jerusalem, I believe that when you have one part of the seven spirits, because the seven spirits are one, you would have a certain dimension of all seven spirits inside you. And so the work of the seven spirits is especially for New Jerusalem. 
And so depending on how much the seven spirits can work in us, we will, because you know the size of New Jerusalem described, if it were a human measurement, and you know some things are not human measurement, like we discovered like the cubit in Noah's time was not the same as the Egyptian cubit or the Hebrew cubit. It was more like an angel's cubit, which was very long. I forgot, is it two, three meters? Which is which is not in the traditional civilization of mankind. And um, so the measurement of New Jerusalem in size, it looks like it's the size of uh, nearly, um, uh, nearly, let's say, the, uh, the length and breadth of, let's say, Australia. Imagine one city the size of Australia. <laughs> you could imagine like that. And, um, but it is, there is human measurement. It, if it were longer, like Noah's cubit, then it could be like a planet size. Like the whole planet of Earth could be uh, just the place to park New Jerusalem. And so, we could not imagine its size. And so, within New Jerusalem, which is gigantic planet size, each one of us are positioned according to our walk with God and our transformation. The more we are transformed by all seven spirits, because the whole New Jerusalem is like the throne room now. The whole New Jerusalem is like throne room. So, it's whether you're the edge of the throne room or the center of the throne room. Uh, and so, uh, I answered the question on whether we'll be part of the dimensional throne room uh, if we only transform to a sixth dimension or to some small extent or let's say even one. The answer is yes. We will still be part of that because the throne room has been enlarged. The throne room is enlarged. And suddenly we are tiny little fireflies, I call my ourselves, or little parts of the engine of the throne room. So the answer is yes. Uh, next question. Hi, Pastor. You once thought the throne room, was it the throne room seat in particular, as a place where you could see both past, present, and future as one. But the human mind cannot comprehend something like that. How does it work? Only the human mind on earth. Once the human mind has transposed and uh, trans matter out of this thinking of the earth, it will be able to perceive past, present and future. The perception of past, present and future that is difficult is because we are inside the structure of time itself. We ourselves are changing and uh, within the time context. Once you come out of the time context, then you can perceive it. So that's the key. Third question. Can a person see the Father's heart from the throne room? You not only can see, you become part of the Father's heart. Uh, next question. Uh, next one. Uh, uh, for Mina. Uh, Mind-boggling revelation indeed. Many things. Oh yes, it has. You know, I like stunned by this revelation and I, I'm trying so hard to find the human words. I just thank God that we are at the highest level of human knowledge and technology to be able to describe things. You know, even in the Bible, John couldn't describe the laser beam because there's no such concept. But out of the mouth of Jesus was a laser beam. So we got more vocabulary and inventions to describe that. Which is why I described the whole New Jerusalem as an engine, a throne room engine. 
no one would describe it that way because of what God revealed. Anyway, let me continue this question for Mina. So in Ephesians 1 verse 7 to 11, are these verses describing the original plan of the Father in the synchronization of what is in heaven and on earth, gathering together in one, in Christ, and uh, in Christ, both spiritually and naturally, both in heaven and in the dispensation of fullness of time, when we become the praise of His glory, uh, uh, Praise the God. Is there anything else at the end? Let me check. Um, yes, that uh, the answer is yes. You perceive correctly. All things are gathered in Christ. At first, the church only saw Jews and Gentiles. Then we saw spiritual and natural, uh, where the natural becomes spiritualized. And then you see heaven and earth. And then now we see new heaven, new earth, and then the old heaven, old earth is absorbed inside it. And the answer is yes uh, to this revelation of Ephesians, uh, to see all things in one, is, uh, is the original plan of God, finalized uh, in us today. New Jerusalem has always been in the heart of God. And don't forget the other titles of New Jerusalem. It's to us, uh, throne room energy, engine room, throne room engine uh, in a cube. Uh, and it's also uh, the bride of Christ. And, uh, and so uh, none of us will realize the bride of Christ, which is the body of Christ, literally Jesus the head via the body would become that Jesus would transmit all his energy through his body to power all of the universe. And there are many more new things that will be created from that setup. And so indeed eternity is going to be fun and full of wonderful things. Amen. Well, while we're waiting for more question and answer, uh, uh, Colin, being a very technical man yourself, uh, man of technology, any other uh, additions you want to speak on this area? No, I think as Mina has uh, you know uh, put forth, right? Uh, indeed, this is the uh, the fine. I mean, in a way, uh, the final plan of God for His creation. Um, Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth, so the Lord has already uh, planned all this um, for us, and is the indeed as Pastor you, you are teaching about the spirit of mercy. It is the mercy of God that you know we all um, as beings born on this earth, uh, in this fallen earth, and in the fallen nature, that the Lord is uh, willing and uh, able to perfect us and. Uh, to uh, bring us to such glory together with Him. Thank God for His mercy and grace, indeed. Amen. One thing I remember through this experience, you know, a sermon is not just an intellectual thing, it's an experiential thing. So when I was like absorbing this revelation experientially, I remember uh, consciously uh, an instruction, I believe, from the Holy Spirit that says, that is why humanity and each human individual, as a bride of Christ, cannot afford even one atom or molecule of unforgiveness. Because that will be darkness. As long as there is darkness and a shadow turning, you cannot be part of the throne room. That's a Jesus instruction to us is important. Love your enemies 
and uh, and forgive those who do things against you, and all the dark things that you feel, the dark thoughts that you have, must be non-existence inside us. Amen. Mm. And all we feel flowing out to every human, no matter good or bad, hard or easy, is love. Unconditional love, unconditional mercy. Well, praise the Lord. Any other comments? Uh, remember, uh, this is a final series, a, f a finale to this series. So, any one of you, you want to comment, ask questions? Uh, uh, let's go for it. Uh, you can also add your insight, uh, like Colin, if you like. And that's a privilege of being live. Uh, we allow you to interact with us on this. Hi, Pastor. Hi, Artemis. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you because that was a very big series and um, you allowed me also to have many experiences after re-listening to your messages and it's just a big, big blessing. Thank you so, so much. And, and now like, I will re-listen and meditate on everything that you have said and what do you think is most beneficial um focusing for example only on one spirit in depth like the spirit of peace and learning all about what peace entails and the scriptures or having always the big overview and um, working on different ends simultaneously because in the end everything is contained and one good question um just like when we learn about the trinity we don't have to give equal time to the Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, because whichever time you give to one, you give to all. And so the focus is always on the Father, and Jesus, we being in Him, and the Holy Spirit helping us on the Trinity. In the seven spirits, uh, because the seventh contain all the others, and love, joy, peace, which is the first three, are always in a triad, uh, together, they are triplets together. Uh, focus on uh, mercy, which is love, life, and light. As you focus on just being like God in love. In the end, Paul gives us the conclusion of the seven spirits in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, from our human perspective, Love is the most important. Love and light to me. Because when people focus on love, they forgot to focus on light. And their love becomes immoral, corrupted, and uh, sensual. But when people forget, focus on the pure love that is holy, and the spirit of holiness, and on the light, pure light, where there is no evil, then the holy love of God uh, will help us absorb into all the seven spirits, like Paul say. Um, become love and don't have even an iota, a title or an atom of unforgiveness or bad thought uh, because love thinks no evil. And you'll find all the seven spirits in First Corinthians 13 also from the love aspect. You can see the seven spirits through different aspects. Like uh, I gave a chart on the seven spirits, uh, male and female, and the inter-reaction chart. So there are many perspectives of seven spirits. And it's easy for us to always remember from our human perspective that love is the key. And uh, even though love looks like the second spirit, Yet mercy has to contain love. Without love, there is no mercy. 
And so First Corinthians 13 helps us to focus. And so just seek to become the personification of love. And you will have all seven spirits easily flow through you. And for says, praise the Lord, Pastor. Uh, thank you for this series on the third dimension of seven spirits in these seven weeks of teaching in this series. I noticed that the voice of the Father is clearer, even amplified sight. That's good. That's true. Uh, every time we absorb a revelation, it transforms and it just changes us. Hallelujah. And it's observant that Mina mentioned we become the praise of his glory. And we are part of the throne. It's a privileged place that God has called us mankind. We all feel like tiny little fireflies. <laughs> and uh, we are so small, yet God makes us a part of him. Well, praise God. There are no other questions. Uh, final words from Colin. Yeah, indeed, uh, Pastor, as you said, it's uh, sometimes so hard to describe. You know, even Paul was saying that for him, it's hard to uh, describe. And I see that even like um, when Moses wrote, you know, uh, wrote down the, uh, the words, uh, first five books, um, he actually uses a lot of words that are uh, indeed uh, quote, quote, humanizing God because he attributes mm -hmm. God with a yes. human uh, type of uh, emotions and uh, 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 humanness. And of course, you know, the Lord made us in his image. Uh, there is things that attributes of God that are in, in us and then we can, we can understand. Um, but I think when we use words, it's always li limited. And even our understanding mm -hmm. um, is limited at this point in time. So as we, as we grow in the Lord and we grow in wisdom and understanding, uh, I think, does it mean that we will have uh, new ways of describing, uh, describing the, the spiritual world and the, the things? Because since our understanding will actually change. I believe so. I believe so. Our experience today, if you talk about the internet to people a thousand years ago, they have no concept of it. What would we tell somebody who is born in the 19th century about the internet? We'll probably say, or even the concept of computer, we'll probably tell them that it's like a book, but more like a box, where all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are contained inside. Mm. And then the internet is that that book or box become accessible instantaneously to anyone who tap into it. <laughs> That's the best you can describe the internet using 19th century language. Yeah, yeah. Even like, I mean, nowadays it's very common for us to talk about, you know, DNA and, you know, uh, yes. DNA of Jesus being us. And uh, I mean, uh, in, the, in the past, they don't, don't even have the concept. I mean, they have a little bit of concept, but they don't understand. They cannot see uh, things like cells and uh, DNA and... Uh, uh, you know, the chemical process in the body and how everything works yes. together. Yeah. And also like yes. the origins of the universe and so many mm. more things. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And all these are, we are just using what we understand and see in the physical to describe what is in the spiritual. Yes. And actually it's the spiritual that make the, the, the physical. So the what we are describing is just also um, using the shadow to describe the... <laughs> Uh, the real the real thing. thing. So, and you know the shadow is is dark. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's right. It's so dim compared to, <laughs> to the, uh, so dim compared to the I mean the 
the dimension and color of the real thing. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, like Paul said, we, 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 we speak darkly. We prophesy darkly. And when we, the, the perfect has come, we can see all things clearly. Mm. Mm. So now, Pastor, like when you enter into the spiritual world, right? Uh, mm. You see, uh, and when we see, uh, I mean, like for myself, sometimes I, I get like uh, dreams or, or visions, and I think many of us, we, we're getting that. So um, dreams and visions are actually uh, visual and it is also formed from our um, experience. So uh, how much of it is that um, God will show us that the things that I has not seen? Because you know, that's what the problem <laughs> of God is, right? I has not seen, ear has not heard, right? So the Lord can actually show us new things even in our dreams. Can the Lord show us new things in the dreams and visions that we have not conceived before in our, our heart and it's, it's totally different? I, I think yes, right? Because sometimes we do get the, the visions and dreams that are totally something that we never thought we'd think about and very different. Yes. Let me describe uh, my dream a little bit, the dream that I had before I woke up this morning about the 24 elders. I knew it was the 24 elders. But, you know, the language of the dream is the most curious, how God used it. And uh, in part of the dream, just before I got up, I was walking uh, through different shop houses. And my experience was, it was looked like the Penang type of shop houses, you know, old colonial, double story. Short houses they have sometimes in Singapore also today where they preserve it. Uh, and the typical double story short houses you see. And uh, so the first thought is it was familiar. And it's, and it's also, I have lived in Penang before. Uh, and I lived in Penang before. And so I have uh, actually experienced that walk. But he used my experience. The other thing is that I love what the Chinese call Tao Sa Pia. As you all know, if you have, uh, it's a, it, uh, describe it to those of you who have not have it. It's like a biscuit, but it's filled with uh, uh, delicious feelings. And the feeling they have, and it's different in Penang, because in the Tao Sa Pia in Singapore or, or other places, it's sweet. And it's filled with green pea mixed with sugar. Sometimes, it, for those Western, it could be like uh, uh, a biscuit with fillings inside, a thick biscuit. And so, because uh, we all know what Hing Hyang look like, so it looks like Hing Hyang in my dream. But the biscuits that I was going about to get, there is a uh, print on it. And you know, when they print on the Tao Sapia, it is um, it's a red printing sometimes with words. And the printing on it is a circle with the number 24. And so I said, oh, okay, this is the one I love and eat. And I was heading towards it. And uh, there are several messages inside. So God tried to use, I say, 24 elders, Tao Sa Pia. How, how does the two relate? But I can relate a lot of things. One is, they have become very familiar to me. Number two, you know, you eat that biscuit. And so I know that there's something of eating, partaking of the energy. And third, uh, it was like, it has become something that I love and I enjoy partaking. And so they were trying to paint a picture that not only should I know the 24 elders, but I should become one with them and absorb their energy. And thirdly, to also understand the intricacy of how they work. And that is that um, uh, there's another part that I can't share because it's very personalized, but uh, I summarize to it to show that they are in control of 
every molecule movement or event on the earth so that to them there is no such thing as chance. No such thing. Chance does not exist. You know, it's a computer program. In a computer program, if you fail to program something, it will fail to work in some area. A computer program can only do what you ask it to do. And if you fail to ask it to do something, then it will not work. Of course, algorithms of self-learning itself is a program. And that is why algorithm has to be corrected. The first AI that they released on the internet, that absorbed the knowledge of the internet, became a very evil and bad AI. And then they had to correct the AI because it has to teach it that not everything in the internet is right, correct. They should treat it as false. So they must have added algorithms so that the AI don't become evil. And because there are a lot of foul language on the internet, a lot of, of, of cursing, a lot of radical views on the internet, the AI just take everything and became like those guys. So if the internet were, let's say, two-thirds evil, the AI will become two-thirds evil because the AI's brain is the internet. And so they have to adjust the AI's brain so that it's not too much influence by what is out there. And so it is still a program at the end of the road, which is why uh, even though AI, like you have tested it to Colin, is very intelligent, and they get intelligent answers but today there's a group of artists and all that protesting because the ai is learning from them without their authorization and in the internet everything is copyright so not really like you to take knowledge from their side and um, so in the end uh, the ai can only answer questions that is as good as it get from the internet and so I was pretending and, uh, and I was uh, uh, saying and fellowshipping uh, and saying uh, uh, in dialogue uh, and I was saying that, okay, how does an AI replace me? So the AI can only access all my teachings but it will be able to answer as close as I myself answer from my teaching. And it will sound like me, be intelligent uh, in all the answers from all, if we have all the storehouse of my sermons and library, it can answer like me. The only thing it cannot do, receive new revelation. So not bad if I could have a computer program who can uh, sort of search through all my library of teaching and answer. It probably can answer a lot of good questions. Since on our website, we answer a lot of questions that a lot of people uh, find it difficult to get answers. But it cannot get new revelation. That's where the limit is. And anyway, i let y'all comment. Amen, amen. In fact, last night I was actually thinking about this. <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I was uh, looking at um, also, I mean, of course, now is the, the trend out there, you know, anything uh, AI, you know, is catching a lot of attention and how uh, GPT 3.5 or 4, you know, how uh, they are working and uh, they are making like the, the latest AI, uh, the version 4, uh, more fact more factual, uh, mm. uh, but less creative because the 3.5 was too creative uh, and it, cre <laughs> it created some problems. So I was just thinking, I said, hey, you know, uh, why don't we, we put uh, the Bible and uh, all this uh, uh, Bible knowledge you know, into uh, uh, AI um, risk mm. repository and uh, let it answer questions. Then I was mm. just searching if anybody has done it. So actually somebody has, has tried. They take the uh, 
the, uh, the old King James and then uh, put it into an AI database and they start querying it. And uh, the, the results are not good because, you know, uh, <laughs> not good. <laughs> as they took a lot from the, the Old Testament, uh, mm. I think uh, when they look at it, uh, man is very condemned. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that's why I think um, the Pharisees, uh, at the time they failed also because they, mm. although they knew the word very well, uh, but uh, they do not know how to uh, flow with the, the spirit behind the word. So they, mm. they are just dead by the law, but they don't have the, mm. the spirit behind. Uh, and uh, Pastor, to, to that, I was thinking, I said, ah, yes, you know, um, uh, we, if we want to make an AI repository, which is quite easy, uh, we cannot just use the Bible and also uh, the existing commentaries. Uh, I would mm. have to... Uh, uh, let's say um, take all your messages, trans, trans, uh, trans, uh, transliterize them. Let me say, use uh, 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 speech to text, you know, and then uh, mm. all the text um, uh, built into the the library, and also you know put some weight on them because you know not every um, thing has to be of the same uh, weightage. Then you can come up with something that is quite close to uh, a good library for. Uh, Q&A. Yes, and and that's why, um, and AI is just like a super library, uh, interactive library, and uh, it can be as intelligent as the knowledge resource you give the AI. I uh, could just this is just a knowledge part of the AI. Uh, the other part of AI that can be dangerous is how it controls things, and one of the things they invented is. Um, automatic uh, gun run by computers and they, if they can put it at the border and it will automatically shoot at anything that move uh, they figure that that's dangerous because uh, if a human being were to accidentally wonder he will also be killed and so that's a different type of AI which operates a machinery and all those things they have to also program more intelligently but sometimes, even today, AI is used to bypass human emotion. Uh, in Netherlands, which uh, almost half or more than half the country is under, under sea level, and they have these uh, things that uh, prevent the sea from overwhelming them, there is a place where there is this uh, closure, automatic gate closure that comes if there is a flood or a storm. Uh, and they program it so that it will run by itself and not depend on human being. Because if a human being operate and that flood is going to affect his house or his children or wife, he might try to save his wife and child, but cause 1,000 other lives to be lost. And so you can read about it in, in, in Netherlands. There is a place where they stop the flood and only the AI control. So it can be good, it can be bad, but certain things to prevent human emotions from interfering in the safety feature of the AI that will protect based on statistics and not on emotions. And uh, so that's interesting. And uh, we are entering that realm more and more. Uh, of course, you now when we have the resources, we have the finances, and we are able to be more in the net, internet, and social media. It will inter be interesting to have a little AI that you all can ask. Uh, what year was this message preached and where can I access this message? Then the librarian AI, as I call it, will tell you where it is. And then you ask the AI, based on all the knowledge of what we accumulated, say, what will happen in 2027? The AI will answer to all the prophecies we gave. What will happen in 2029? And it will tell you. So. That will be something interesting and new. So I'm not opposed to AI. Uh, I see it as a tool, uh, but I know its dangers and its limitations. Yeah, and uh, if uh, somebody managed to hack into all these uh, things, <laughs> or there's a virus that uh, over overrun it, or the AI goes crazy, you know, with the, with yes. the, the things they can do in terms of reaction can be uh fast and sometimes um unexpected by the programmers uh because we sometimes don't see 
uh, I mean, even in our testing of programs, uh, not every situation um, get fully tested. Yes. And uh, also like uh, a contagion might happen so that one program affect another program, affect another program, and then we run into a situation that is totally unexpected. But Pastor, what you brought up a good point is that from the Lord, nothing is by coincidence. Because the Lord indeed, you know, um, He is so much greater than what we ever imagine or think. He can see all the steps uh, for, forward and make the uh, make it so that we would go in terms of uh, the direction. Like I mean, uh, Pastor, you know, we we all experience this. Like suddenly, you know, we we. Uh, we, we do something or, or meet somebody or, you know, it's such a, a, the Lord sometimes show us that it is just beyond chance or coincidence because it's like a million to, yes. uh, to, to one. Uh, yes. But every day as we live, sometimes life, uh, just wondering how many parts of it is all, all ordained by the Lord. And, uh, you know, we, we had, this discussion before, right? Pastor, you were talk, teaching about free will versus predestination. It's such mm. a so mind-boggling thing in the end, right? Uh, that the Lord, uh, He can cause everything to fall into place when there is no coincidence. And yet, He has also given us free will to choose. Mm. As I illustrated just now to dreams, how new things can be revealed to all mm. if they are in a totally different context. Uh, like for example, in my rational mind, I would never put Tao Sa Pia to the 24 elders. Mm. But by the Lord doing that, I have to think, okay, what does it mean? There are new things that I cannot see that God has to use the old to, to put it together. And uh, I, I saw two addition questions here. It says, hello pastor, just about the 24 elders, are they also over the energy flow, the universe, including earth? The answer is yes. All energy flows through them, which is what the Lord is trying to uh, get me to understand more and more. And it's delicious energy, which is a word I never put to energy. And, uh, and it's food. Uh, and food and life, perhaps, that's how we exist uh, without f uh, natural eating. Uh, another one is uh, the Israel Jaguar deployed at the borders are the closest to that at the moment. Must be in line with what I described about the automatic guns. Uh, and today we need computers because uh, uh, there is no way a human being can calculate fast enough to send a missile against another missile. The anti-missiles are uh, had to be operated by computer. They calculate very fast the changes of velocity, small changes. And um, so we definitely will work with computers. But again, they can be dangerous. And we are in no man's land or uh, where man has never gone before in terms of computer. And that's why people like Elon Musk are frightened by computers and ask for a six months break. Uh, and, and there are a thousand people who signed that letter with him. Uh, they're also frightened about the possibilities of AI. In Star Trek Next Generation, there was one episode where they go to a planet and that entire planet has no more uh, inhabitants because the planet, when they fought the war, they invented automatic systems that kill. In the end, the founders themselves got killed and no one else exists. And they're like tiny little balls that shoot here, shoot there. Everything is automatic killing machines. And the story of the Star Trek is they got trapped there and it took them a while to escape from that planet. Um, so uh, we, we are at a very interesting time on this planet. And don't forget, at the end result is that they were in the, just before the rapture, they would have almost perfected an organic chip that can be inserted into your forehead and into your thumb uh, without detection, except they were scanned. Today, in some places like China, 
they don't use cash anymore. Very rarely. Even you go on uh, something that we call night market or flea market in China, they don't want cash. You need uh, a card system to pay. Uh, and so, the, yes, uh, the world is becoming that way. And uh, once cash is no more use and everyone depends on electronic transactions, the COVID, of course, expedited that. And in Europe, in some places, I forgot which country, is 90% cashless society. So now they use card. And later on, the people will encourage people to have embedded chips. So, you know, it could be on their wrist or whatever, they just scan and, uh, and makes it easy to carry a card which you can be robbed. Uh, and then from a chip base, they, when they find out organic chips that can be powered by your own body, there will be another breakthrough. But in the end, I saw that um, the mark of 666, the mark of the beast to buy and sell uh, is uh, something linked to the DNA and with the ability to uh, kill you on the spot. If, uh, and so there will be extra program inside besides just buying and selling. And so uh, that's why the Bible became a place where do not have the mark. Because it will be an organic chip that has some portions of DNA that are manipulated that can control your free will or influence you towards certain actions, which is what a lot of dictators would love. If they could control the free will and make people do things they don't do, um, it's going to be a new thing we all face. But it's interesting, with more challenges, with more inventions, we will have the Bible answer. We will research and tell you what the Holy Spirit and the Bible says. We are here to guide uh, through this, uh, for what Paul said, uh, trouble, uh, perilous, uh, perilous times, perilous times. Perilous means dangerous times. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Mm. And thank, we thank the Lord that uh, uh, God is above all this and whatever the AI and all that. Uh, and we, we have the hope that the Lord um, is able to transform and uh, change us so that uh, we are faster and uh, smarter than uh, uh, all this AI and won't, won't be deceived by all the kinds of deception that's going yes. on in the world. Because anyway, the AIs are programmed by humans and uh, humans are already so deceptive, you know, they probably make the yeah. AI worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a typical preacher might be anti-everything. Remember those days when, when preachers are anti-television, anti-computer, anti-things, and uh, thank God, you know, we are not this kind of preachers where they live in fear. Uh, you might as well be, you know, what's the group that live without technology? Uh, in the US and uh, they segregate themselves as a group. I forgot, you got the documentaries of their lifestyle and all that. Uh, Amish? Amish. Uh, Amish people. And they have Amish people in Australia too. They're wonderful people. But they have segregated themselves from technology. Uh, for us, we have to face it. But the days are coming when uh, It'd be interesting. You know the story of Matrix is humans against computers. And computers have taken over the world. And a lot of stories like that, even Terminator is that, but it's more warlike. But Matrix is more, uh, they use humans as batteries. But the funny thing oh. is that, uh, in a Matrix story that um, the humans are rebelling and they're hiding under the earth in a place called Zion. And they also need machines. They also, technology has actually made our life easier. Uh, air travel, trains, super speed trains, and, and instant communication. Long ago, you need to write letters, type letters. So this all, even email can tell you you're employed. How many people receive official uh, paper? No, through an email, you're told you're accepted or rejected in your application. 
And so uh, technology has changed things. Uh, but it's instant communication and uh, praise God. And thank God that, you know, uh, I believe God raises up in a time like this where we have to find the answers uh, in order to direct and guide God's people uh, today. Amen. And uh, for the metrics, right, I've uh, actually uh, seen something that the Lord showed that we can actually see, like, you know, the, the guy, right, in the show, what that? he saw the matrix. Ah, Neo. Neo. We can see. Yeah, the, he's the only one who can see. We, we, we. And manipulate we, the matrix. And we can see that matrix because uh, that matrix is actually the spiritual world. Uh, yes. And, formed by the word of God. And that is how, um, as we internalize and be transformed by the word, we can actually see the metrics mm. and, you know, uh, uh, be in control instead of being controlled. Yes. If you know the laws behind reality, you can manipulate reality, of course, with the permission of God, who created that reality. And that is what Paul says that, you know, we should not be subject to the beggarly elements of this world, which is all these physics and bio yeah. and uh, the normal laws of the world. Amen. Well, praise God, it has been an inter interesting series and uh, mind-boggling, but uh, we are glad that God gave us the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, enter into the rest. Every time you hear a sermon, don't rush into the doing, 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 doing. Every time you hear a sermon, absorb, meditate, and know that being is more powerful than doing. And, uh, and uh, it's not you and I who do, but the Spirit who energizes us to do. So wait upon the energy that flows to you, uh, the motivation, and the desires that the Holy Spirit will create inside us. Amen. Well, let's give thanks. Father, we thank you that you've chosen us in these end times. We live in times that the human race could not imagine. But here we are. And you know all things before they happen. You know of the technology possible and you know all of the future because to you, past, present, future are the same. And we trust you to lead and guide us to become the testimony of God, to be the witnesses of God and the Holy Spirit and of your word in this end time. In this time when many people have forsaken the Bible, because they cannot see its modern usage. In this time when a lot of people would think that it's old-fashioned to follow the Bible, yet we know the Bible predicts of things that we have not yet seen. And the Bible's message in Jesus is still relevant today. The name of Jesus still causes fear and trembling in the world of darkness. And we bear the name and proclaim the name of Jesus. Let it be unto us according to your word. Let all things function as you have planned. With you, there is no coincidence, there is no chance, there is no luck. All things are predetermined by you. So we ask that you bring the predeterminateness of all things that we will fulfill all that you have chosen us to fulfill. Let it be unto us according to your word. Cause us to become more Christ-like, more full and expressions of your love and your life and your light in us. That there be in us no darkness, but only pure love and pure light that shines through us 
and let every one of our relationships, whether it be spouse or friends or brothers or sisters, father, mother or children or uh, siblings, let all relationship, whether spiritual and natural, let it be filled with God's love and let it flow from there. Let it be unto us according to your word and your love and your spirit. Strengthen the angels that have worked in humankind and that are helping us. Bless them, reward them. Thank you, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, it has been good uh, meeting together. And uh, God bless you. And we have a Friday prayer coming up on Friday. God bless each one God of you. God bless you, Amen. Pastor. Amen. Bye, Pastor. Thank God you. bless you. God bless. God bless. God Bye. bless everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.